Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Did you get what you wanted for Christmas? I think everybody in my household was pleased. Well, most everybody. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Last Christmas, I was having a conversation with a young man, a member of my household, and uh, I had asked him, I said, name, uh, what is Christmas all about? And he looked back at me so proudly, and he goes, Santa. And he's learned a lot since he was two years old, I have to tell you. I commend this young man for his honesty, even if he was honestly mistaken. This year, he asked me that when baby Jesus was born, what did he get for Christmas when he was a baby? And I said, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Yet, it's not just children who are sometimes confused about the true meaning of Christmas. Sparse attendance on Christmas Day, most Sundays, or most actually most years, that are non-blizzard years, uh, together with the fact that there are churches, even before this little bit of snow came, uh, that decided that they were going to close their doors because Christmas fell on a Sunday. And that would seem to indicate to me that there is unclarity about how you celebrate Christmas, which is a church holiday. But you're here, and I'm very glad of that. Man has a propensity to be distracted from the true meaning of ultimate things. St. Athanasius, one of the greatest fathers of the ancient church, wrote a wonderful little book called On the Incarnation. Makes for very good Christmas time reading. And the main thesis of the book that he writes in the fourth century is, uh, is looking at man's fallen condition and also the remedy that we have in Christ. And just to read to you a little bit, this is how Athanasius describes our state and also the remedy. He writes, Men had turned from the contemplation of God above and were looking for him in the opposite direction, down among created things and things of sense, by which he means by the senses, the five senses. The Savior of us all, the Word of God, in his great love, took to himself a body and moved as man among men, meeting their senses. He became himself an object for the senses, so that those who were seeking God in sensible things might apprehend the Father through the works which he, the Word of God, did in the body. Human and human-minded as men were, therefore, to whichever side they looked in the sensible world, they found themselves taught the truth. Were they awe-stricken by creation? They beheld it, confessing Christ as Lord. Did their minds tend to regard men as gods? The uniqueness of the Savior's works marked him alone of men as Son of God. Were they drawn to evil spirits? They saw them driven out by the Lord and learned that the word of God alone was God and that the evil spirits were not gods at all. Were they inclined to hero worship and the cult of the dead? Then the fact that the Savior had risen from the dead showed them how false these other deities were and that the word of the Father is the one true Lord, the Lord even of death. For this reason was he both born and manifested as man. For this he died and rose in order that eclipsing by his works all other human deeds, he might recall men from the paths of error to know the Father. As he says himself, I came to seek and to save that which was lost. So we had a problem that the fall of man had drawn us downward into ourselves, deeper and deeper. And instead of looking toward God, we began to look to our own passions and to our own toys and to our own misconceptions about who God is. Now, it is not as if we did not know this before Jesus came, because God has not left himself without a witness. It's true uh, that uh, God is not actually far from each of us. But if you think back to those days before the nativity of our Lord, uh, the closest that most people got to God was in the written code. Words that were scrawled on papyrus or etched in stone. And if we were to use St. John's phrase from the gospel today, the law, which was given to us through Moses. And this was actually a grace to us from God, that God would reveal himself 
that he would speak to the prophets, that he would record his will and his word as Holy Scripture, even if this was all in type and shadow. But God was not, remain, was not content to remain our pen pal, receiving our prayers and then writing us letters in response. What God would rather do is come and spend Christmas with us. He came to us, and this is what he had to do. After all, we are too easily distracted. We are too busy looking not toward the contemplation of God, but toward ourselves and created things. We are drawn further and further into ourselves. We hear the law, and being unable to do it apart from Christ, we are drawn closer and closer to hell. And among men's greatest excuses for doing this and continuing in sin and making himself his own God was that he said, well, God, and this is not entirely incorrect, but he said, God, if he can be known at all, is mostly unknowable. And St. John would agree to a degree. He says that no one has ever seen God. So God had to do something. He had to come within the range of man's fallen senses. He had to put himself in the field of man's spiritual vision because our spiritual radar had been knocked out by sin. We were not able to see God. The only things that we could really perceive were the earthly and the material. And so you see that God has quite the task for himself to give our attention. How could the unknowable become knowable? At least as noble as God can become. You know that the only one who really knows God is God. So it is a God-sized task for God to enter into the world of man and to reveal himself. To us, that seems as if God has to enter into what we consider the confines of our limited human existence. The finite had to become capable of the infinite. Now, to pull that off would be nothing short of a miracle, but this is the kind of thing that God does. You ever heard the old saying, give me a worm that understands man, I'll give you a man that understands God. And yet, this is sort of what God has done. What, what would happen, then, if God has stepped off on the page of Holy Scripture and we found that uh, the word of God is not just words that are written on the page, but it is the eternal word himself. What if the one that heaven cannot hold allows himself to be held, say, in the arms of a woman as a baby? And what if man could no longer plead the excuse that he had never seen God? He didn't know anything about him. What if man, what if you and me, so distracted and deathly ill, could see God face to face and live. There's only one way that God could have done it, to get man's attention this way. For man to know God, to grapple with God as he can be known, God must become man. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So what God did not do is he did not swoop down and have a quick solution to man's problem. He didn't thunder and fire and cloud from the mountain the way that he did when he gave us the law. But rather what God did is he became a child. He became a baby. It really is remarkable. I don't know if you've ever noticed how all children love the Christmas story. You ever noticed this? That this is a story that they, they pick up on, you know, when they're, when they're small. And they recognize the characters. They know Mary and Joseph. They know the angels and the wise men. They know the star and the manger. And generally speaking, children like babies. And so for them to find out that their Lord Jesus was once a baby too, fills them with delight. And you see, Christmas is a story that you grow into. That we're all still growing into. When you've outgrown your part in the pageant, when all the birthday cake for Jesus has been eaten up, and when presents don't excite you quite as much as they used to. They still do a little bit. But when that happens, and probably more seriously for us, when you get to Christmas and you find that you, those who you would like to spend it with the most are now gone, you're still confronted with the greatest mystery of all, that the child who is laid to rest in Mary's lap is God. 
And you know, as you grow in to Jesus' story, as you kind of grow with Jesus, then the mystery only deepens. Even as we grapple with God as a baby, we are eventually led to grapple with another very human reality that we become all too familiar with, and that is death. And that is where the mystery deepens even more. Tis mystery all, the immortal dies. That the baby sheds his swaddling clothes and he exchanges them for the clothes of the grave. That this child leaves the cave in Bethlehem for the cave of his tomb. How can that be? And you know, very much apart from the death of God, death is the sort of thing that uh, we both understand and cannot understand at the same time. I think that we understand well enough that the death is the ceasing of the biological functions of an organism. And we mentally assent when we talk about the theological reason for death, we know that death is a consequence of what man has done. That when man is distracted and he averts his eyes from the contemplation of God, then he no longer beholds the vision that gives him and sustains his life. That makes sense rationally, but what sense does death make when you stand at the grave of a loved one? And it could be somebody who lived to a ripe old age, it could be somebody who was taken from you tragically or suddenly or in a terrible way. Why would God allow that? And you see, God in the flesh has been there too. That God has stood and he has wept at the tomb of Lazarus. And we all, in a sense, have stood at God's grave. Now you and I cannot see beyond the grave. But a man, flesh and blood, born, growing, weeping, loving, dying. That we can't understand because that is all of us. We know what it means dimly for a man to live and to die, but now we also know a man who is living again. And we know this because we have become more than we once before. St. John tells us today, to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the power to become children of God, who were begotten, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. A miracle has taken place within us. There's, there's first the miracle of the incarnation, you know, that God becomes a human being, that he's born of Mary. But there is another miracle. The miracle is that we believe. Luther, I couldn't find it for you, I'm sorry. But Luther, uh, I remember he writes somewhere uh, that, uh, in his opinion, the greater miracle than God becoming a man is that Mary believed what the angel said. This is a miracle that he works within us. We believe by a miracle. And baptismal water, which has made us to be children of God, has washed the scales off of our eyes. It has revived our senses. And now we see with this clearer vision, kind of like what our first parents had in Eden. And we realize that Jesus is more than just a man. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. We see then God lying in a manger, dying on the cross, God bursting forth from the grave. We see God in the face of Jesus Christ, and we receive him as our own forever. So, did you get what you wanted for Christmas? I have, well, almost. In a few moments, God has the best gift of all for us. He has saved the very best for last. So come and receive him. Merry Christmas. Amen.